Little Novels by Wilkie Collins. A series of five short stories dramatized by John Arden. With Ronald Pickup as Wilkie Collins. Number two, Miss Jeremet and the Clergyman. This clergyman came to see me, the Reverend Stephen Wheatmeal. Vicar, it appeared, of our parish church in the Madeleman Road, which I do not attend. Rumours had reached him concerning my way of life. Local Pharisees had told him it was his duty to remonstrate. <laughs> I don't stand nonsense from such meddlers. I told him politely I was immersed in a book. All apologies, my dear sir, but these are my working hours. I must finish this chapter before the pain of my gout overcomes me. Oh, there's brandy and soda on the side table. Pray refresh yourself while you wait. No, if you won't, I will. Oh, uh, for me, alas, a glass full of tincture of opium. Oh. He knew who I was. Wilkie Collins. Famous man who makes up stories for a living makes him up rather too rapidly these days. I haven't got long to live. Because of which I've been thinking a good deal about marriage. Because I never have been married. Couldn't bear to be married. Yet I have two, as I call them, wives. Also three children. I'm told we should all believe in moral and cultural progress as we wend our way through history. That's absurd. Here we are, already the final quarter of the 19th century, and still we must pretend that one of my wives is my paid housekeeper, while the other one, she lives just around the corner, is the virtuous spouse of a totally fictional gent of the name of Mr Dawson. And for whose benefit all this pretense, hmm? My friends know the truth. I never told them, but they know. The rest of the world don't care, so long as no-one forces them to care. But, of course... There are the clergy. I don't think the Reverend Mr Wheatmeal would have bothered. Only he knew I was famous and he couldn't resist. Uh, what is the book, Mr Collins, that so uh, engrosses your attention? No, a collection of murderers. I've studied them as material for my fiction. The one I'm reading is the case of Julian Blacklock, acquitted of killing his wife a good many years ago. You'll remember it, no doubt. His face had gone ghastly pale. His eyes were fixed upon my book. What in the world is the matter with you? I had almost forgotten. Now I am reminded. Acquitted. He should not have been. No, he was guilty. Surely no one contested the verdict? No, but there were circumstances never communicated to judge or jury. I know them. My knowledge, my personal experience. Very sad, very strange, very terrible. Mr Collins, I must confess, I came here to recall to you your Christian duty in this parish, such being my duty as its minister. But to see you read that book, that chapter of that book has thrown me all abroad, compelling me to wonder how can I claim to have any true knowledge of what duty truly is. Now, Mr Collins, we are strangers. Perhaps thus I can confide to you what I never, never could tell an intimate. Mr Collins, upon an impulse... His impulse, I suspect, was not to confide to just any sort of stranger, but rather to a man of letters who might write him up. He did extract a promise that I should not attempt to publish it till after his death, and then, if I understood its importance, I should... You should tell it as I tell it to you. He began so slowly and tediously, let me try to cut him short, began by informing me he had sadly disappointed his father, an archdeacon. He was an archdeacon. I was a stubborn young man. I insisted upon the law for my profession in preference to the church. Bachelor chambers in the temple, careless enjoyment of the pleasures of London life. One such notorious pleasure being the variety of amusement available in the Cremorn Gardens, Chelsea. More specifically, the young women available. I, too, have frequented the gardens now and again. <laughs> One fine summer evening, I had gone there alone. I took a turn or two around the dancing platform, but I was not in my usual good spirits. The music jarred upon my nerves. 
the painted ladies of the night for some reason disgusted me. And then... And then he found a lady who was not at all disgusting. In fact, she was in some danger at the hands of a drunken man. Oh, leave me directly, sir. I wish to have nothing to say to you. You then! How dare you! Leave the lady alone! I was only prevented from knocking the ruffian down by the fortunate arrival of a policeman. I led her away at once. She was slight, small, dark, perfectly charming. If I can sit down, sir, for a few minutes, please, I shall soon be myself again, and I shall trespass no further on your kindness. You are too young and too pretty to trust yourself alone in such a place as this. I have no friend to take care of me. I was sad and sorry this evening all by myself. I thought I would come to hear the music. No friend to take care of you? Surely there must be one happy man who might... What man do you mean? The man whom we call in England, uh, sweetheart. Yes, I took a vulgar liberty, and she... She let him know it was indeed a vulgar liberty. But then she let him know that she had once had a sweetheart who had gone away and left her. She wanted to go home. Young Wheatmeal was determined not to part with her. She allowed him, after some demur, to walk with her back to her lodgings in a shabby little by-street. Under a street lamp, she allowed him to bid her good night. She allowed me very nearly to kiss her, and she said, oh, most gravely and kindly, I think I do know a gentleman when I see one. You may come to this house, sir, if you please, and call upon me tomorrow. Hello, monsieur. Au revoir. Ask for me by the name of Mademoiselle Jaromet. Yes. He was embarrassed to recount to me what happened next. I guessed it already, of course. Let me pass as rapidly as possible over the next shameful year of my life. Clearly a year of unparalleled ecstasy with his exquisite little mistress. French into the bargain and kept with the utmost discretion in a corner of Chelsea. Moreover, she wasn't expensive. A small, very small income of her own, which she augmented by colouring portraits for the photographers. She utterly refused to rely upon my money. About herself, her family in France, her surname even, she refused to tell me anything. And as for the other man, the sweetheart who had gone away, again she refused to speak of him. But one morning, very early, as we... Uh, as we... As we lay in her bed making love is what he would have said, but couldn't quite manage it. I was unguarded enough to assure her that I would love her all my life. Oh, Jeremy, all my life. Oh, my darling, ma chérie, mon amour, mon petit chou. Her response was uncompromising. Oh, dear Stephen, mm. I like you. Mm. I respect you. I shall always be faithful to you while you are faithful to me. But my love has gone from me. There is another man who has taken it away with him. I know not where. <sighs> and that's all you will tell me? All. But if he does come back, will you receive him? Against my own better judgment, yes. The day of his return will bring with it the darkest days of my life. But my darling, you have a will of your own. Where he is concerned, no. I love him. And it is my misfortune. We have said enough about it. No more. You are to embrace me, if you please. Once again. So... Mm. Mm. Oh, such was my infatuated state, that had she agreed, I would certainly have married her, despite the obvious outrage to both family and society. As it was, our secret connection was apparently so permanent and sincere that I... Well, after a year, did I not come to regard her as my wife? <laughs> His secret wife. That's where the mistake was, where the mistake always is. And then my mother fell deadly ill. The doctors told us she could not live. Here, yeah, perhaps the greatest of all possible mistakes. He swore he would obey his dying mother's last request. She entreated me to reconsider my refusal to enter the church, if only for the sake for of... the sake of his father, the archdeacon, allegedly so very near death himself, so distressed for so many years that his son was not already a curate. I... 
Oh, there's too many people in this damnable story so very near death. Can it be I emit a premature reek of the graveyard that narratives of this sort come swarming about me like carrion crows? Yep, the facts, as he tells them, hook themselves into me. I cannot be rid of them. I have to write them down. So, picture, if you will, this dutiful unfortunate as he wanders at sunset toward Chelsea, wanders and wonders how to tell his mistress that holy orders are now his destiny. Clergymen do not have mistresses. Oh, God, he has no choice but to tear himself free. To tear myself free from all unworthy associations. The broad surface of the River Thames was hidden from me in a chill white mist. I ask myself in despair the one dreary question. What am I to say to her? Impossible quandary between the right thing to do and the right thing to do, and yet, in the upshot, he never need resolve it for... For when I entered her little sitting room, she was not at her work as usual. My darling, this is difficult. A difficulty, I, I have to explain. I saw in her face that something was wrong. She was holding an open letter. Stephen, please read this. Read it and remember how I told you a year ago what might happen. This is... is the man who deserted you. No name, just the initial J. He is bitterly sorry for everything. He begs you to marry him. On condition the marriage is secret. For so long as his parents are alive, he begs you, forgive, forget. He begs you. How have you answered? I have refused to see him until first I spoke to you. It is only right I should hear your opinion. Mr. Collins, impossible quandary. What was right and what was right, and now there was a third right obliterating both of them. For was it not right for me to allow her to marry the only man she really loved? A man much like me, so it seemed. I was, surreptitiously, hugely grateful to this man and his fierce, obsessive love. And yet, how I hated him. So, what do you say? My darling, you must be free to decide for yourself. I have no claim on you. Who can have no claim. Do you suppose, Mr. Collins, this was noble renunciation? Or sly, debased poltroonery? Whichever it was, she made little of it. Only her face was so pale, her fingers so icily cold as they closed round my hand. Jeremette, one thing before I go, you promise me, if I am nothing more, I am always your friend. If you are ever in trouble, oh, Jeremette, promise me you will let me know. So, you feel what I feel? Forebodings. Bien sûr. Stephen. I believe I shall die young and die miserably. And yes, you shall hear of it. God bless you. You have been very kind to me. Let me kiss you. Always, my friend. Hmm. Adieu. Perhaps not au revoir. Au revoir was what I most desired. But after what she'd said, I dreaded it. Out in the street again, I looked up at her window through the pouring rain. She had pulled the curtains back. She stood in the dim lamplight in her purple merino dress with the white silk kerchief loosely around her neck. Her hand was raised to wave to me, and then the curtains closed. Nothing before me, nothing round me, but the darkness and the night. Within two years, I was ordained. Before I was 30, my father's interest secured for me a living in the West Country. That father of his had not been at all near death. Instead, he was now a widower, a condition which actually appeared to invigorate him. The parish had every advantage save an adequate income, so I determined to receive a few gentlemanly pupils at bed and board in my vicarage. Became, in short, a crammer for the university entrance. Half neglected his spiritual duties while he built his academic reputation. Though, for God's sake, how spiritual was he? After a year or two, my father in London arranged a most bountiful gift for me. 
An ancient friendship with the Dean of St. Paul's had enabled him... Enabled the Archdeacon to secure, as he put it, for my talented son the dazzling opportunity of preaching from the cathedral pulpit. What do you think of that, boy, eh? As he put it. What should I think? Dazzling. So, why not a topical theme? A moral exemplar out of the pages of the daily newspaper. The trial that same year of Palmer, the Staffordshire poisoner... A country doctor turned criminal from his addiction to the pleasures of the race course. Where Dr. Palmer, brothers and sisters in Christ, wagered upon horse after horse and lost his money copiously. The lives of certain of his patients were insured in his favour. He had acted upon their betting tips. For more fool you, he heard them jeer, in the way that sporting men do jeer at a fellow gamester's misfortune. Imagine the provocation, the temptation, the ever-present satanic suggestion that insidious medicinal overdoses need be no more iniquitous than the odd drink after dinner. I meant to say that from the vice of placing bets to the crime of mixing poison was a much shorter step than most good Christians could conceive. I meant to say, I think I did say, that could we but recognise our own frailty... Sensuality, I suppose, and discern, by the grace of God, how to put a sudden stop to the sweetness of our enjoyments before they... before they... I suppose I was preaching almost against my will from experience. I suppose... I suppose your congregation was powerfully affected. Alas, Mr Collins, woe, alas, yes. Woe, alas, what? For as soon as the service was over, one of them came round to the vestry to see me. A handsome young man of excellent breeding. I immediately disliked him, and I cannot tell you why. You will perhaps incorrectly assume I am judging him by hindsight when you hear that he gave his name to me as Blacklock. Blacklock? Uh, Julian Blacklock? Aha! Uh -huh. At last the plot comes together. Do you make a, a long stay in London, Padre? The proposal he so abruptly laid before me was not of itself obnoxious. I return, sir, tomorrow to... To the tranquillity of your rural parish, yes. Would you object to take me with you as one of your pupils? Uh, uh... Mr Wheatmeal, you hesitate. I do realise I am already five and twenty, while your pupils are only in their teens. But the truth is, I have wasted all my opportunities. I am desperately anxious before it is too late to enter the university to mend my ways to put a sudden stop. You see, sir, I quote the very words of your powerful discourse. I could not, in conscience, ignore his appeal. So he came to the West Country. Undeniably studious and diligent, upon all save myself he made a most favourable impression. Even his reserved, almost sullen demeanour was regarded by the female servants as romantic. Unrequited love, they said, had driven him from his friends and his home. At all events, something had driven him. Aha! Uh -huh. Something criminal? The word is not too strong. He lived beneath my roof like a man in dread. He never received his letters there, but had them left at the post office, where only he must call for them. If he walked to the village or through the fields, he peeped furtively over his shoulder. One evening in the village street, I quietly overtook him. I meant to scotch the mystery once and for all. Mr Blacklock, excuse me a moment. Oh, oh it's only... Uh... Mr Blacklock, it is only me. Shall we stroll together? Excuse me, but I have noticed, cannot help noticing, that you appear to have some trouble on your mind. Ah, 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 yes. When you preached in St Paul's, I suppose you were in earnest. For I am one of the people you are preaching at. Yes, I am tortured and tempted. I am hiding myself away from it here. The only reason why I am here. What the devil do I care for the varsity entrance? You are here under false pretenses. You admit it and expect to remain. I am fleeing the encroachment of a most terrible potential crime. Is not that ground for Christian compassion? Wheatmeal, you're a man of God. For God's sake, don't turn me away. So, of course, I had to ask him what on earth he was talking about. I asked him, I asked him again. And do you know, Mr Collins, he would not tell, except to mumble and mutter about a, about a person. 
No name, no detail. There is this person in the way of my prospects of life. A person provokes me horribly. Like the Staffordshire murderer. When I am with that person, I am... Wheatmeal, I am tempted. I cannot, I will not explain. Then until you explain, I have nothing to say to you. I bid you good night. Wheatmeal, come back. You're the only man who can help me. Wheatmeal, for the sake of heaven. I believe in the end he would have explained. But for what happened the next afternoon, a letter, unprecedented, delivered to him at the vicarage. He read it in private. He came to me, trembling, with a travelling bag in his hand, and a spasm, Mr. Collins, of sheer fury contorting his face. I beg your pardon. I must ask for leave of absence for a day or two. Business in London. Julian, I implore you. Treat me like a friend and tell your trouble. Business in London. Beg your pardon. No. I had hitherto disliked him. Now I began to despise him. I would not keep him as a pupil for a single day longer. I had only just made up my mind on this point when in came my housekeeper to say she had discovered... Of course she discovered the old nosy Parker with all her romantic presuppositions in Julian Blacklock's bedroom hidden between the bed and the wall. A daguerreotype miniature, a portrait of... Mr. Wheatmeal, I have guessed it! Oh, my Lord God, yes, of my darling Jeromet. So this was the man who had taken all her love, whose return to her arms would bring her to her darkest days. He had wronged her, he had fled from her, she had pursued him and she had found him. And now he was tempted, for she stood in the way of his prospects of life. Tempted to do what? What had Dr Palmer done in Staffordshire? What did I do there and then? I'll give him this. He wasted no time. Looked at the clock. Calculated. Calculated when Blacklock's train would arrive at Paddington, and from there he'd have to go to Chelsea. A telegram to Chelsea might possibly, just possibly, get there first. A chance, a chance. Yet the telegraph office was five miles from the village. Saddle my horse. Gallop. Dear God! Composing as I rode the words of the message. If you are in trouble, telegraph back to me. I will be with you by the first train. Answer in any case. Hour after hour, I waited for that answer until they told me the telegraph had shut down for the night. Slowly, I turned my horse homeward. Slowly, slowly homeward between the hedgerows. Struck, as he repeated to me several times over. Struck with a strange and a stony despair and a chill that crept through me to the bone. It was a warm July night. How could I have felt so cold? <laughs> and there, beside the road, darkness and night, I saw what the horse saw. A pillar of white mist, like the mist on the River Thames, between five and six foot high. Now it was moving beside me, keeping pace with me at the edge of the road, all the way to my house, and it seemed to come into the house. He sat at his desk in his study. The portrait that the housekeeper had found was on the desk. The pillar of mist was beside the desk, over above the portrait. It lengthened the pillar of mist. It grew luminous, and little by little, it began to turn into the figure of Jeromet, as I expected. For had she not promised, when she died, I should hear of it. In her purple merino dress, white silk kerchief at her neck, I begged her to speak to me. All she could do was to point to her portrait and his name in her handwriting underneath it to point to her kerchief. And there, as she pointed, I saw it drenched with blood. In the newspapers next day, a Frenchwoman found dead, stabbed in the throat in London. It said the corpse was discovered at the time, the same time, the very hour of the evening that I and my horse... Mr Collins, you have your book. Read all the rest of it there. Mm. 
Lack of direct evidence, so Blacklock, of course, acquitted. That transpired, he had secretly married her, treacherously abandoned her. His pretense that there had been no marriage, while his parents insisted it was time they found a wife for him. Bigger me, uh, Mr Collins. Cynical, mendacious, mercenary. And so Jeremette got wind of it and she threatened to expose him. What else could he do but kill? Mr Collins, it is not possible for an Anglican Christian to accept the possibility of that which I sat in my study and saw. So, would you say I was at fault deliberately to have forgotten the whole story for a score of years? Would you say she was rightfully his wife or mine? Would you say that I could ever again rightfully preach upon the sacrament of marriage to anyone? <laughs> He remained in my house all evening and he wept while I agonised in every limb and drank down my opium. Constant and maddening alternation of pain, drugs, drug-induced compulsion to make stories out of everything that comes into my dreams. And then pain again, drugs again, dreams again. Oh, I've been warned I might die within the year. Me, the sole creature alive, to have heard the entire life of this man. It had been such a wilderness of misjudgment. And only now, grey-haired and gaunt, had he suddenly tumbled to it. Oh, dear. Oh, am I going to have time to write it? In Miss Jeremet and the Clergyman by Wilkie Collins, dramatised by John Arden, Ronald Pickup was Wilkie Collins, John Rowe, the Reverend Stephen Wheatmeal, David Brooks, the Reverend Wheatmeal as a young man, Alison Pettit, Jeremet, and David Bannerman, Julian Blacklock. The pianist was Colin Guthrie. The director was David Blount. And tomorrow's story by Wilkie Collins is a satirical tale which begins when handsome 30 something Marmaduke Farmer falls in love with the daughter of a strict Scottish minister while taking shelter from a storm. Mr. Marmaduke and the minister at the same time tomorrow. <laughs>